Hi, how's it going? Um, my name is Cam, I'm 22. <laughs> and yeah, I uh, converted a 2013 Mercedes Sprinter. And yeah, this is how it went. Whoops. So why van life? Looking through old photos, I guess you could say, you know, perhaps it's always been in me. Fast forward 22 years and I was approaching uh, graduation uh, from my undergrad and I was thinking about postgrad and what I was gonna do. And um, so I did the math and just in rent over four years, I would have been paying like 34 grand and then that's on the low end. Now combine that with a car, insurance, fuel, you know, at the end of four years, I would have nothing to show for it, you know, renting. Um, so after a budget plan for the van, the steep upfront up overhead costs are, are offset by the fact that I pay a couple hundred per year for insurance and will never have another utility bill for as long as I live. Um, I've saved myself thousands and I have a pretty cool asset to my name. Um, you know, not many 22 year olds can say that they're mortgage free and pay a couple hundred per year in insurance. And, you know, taking one look at the current Canadian housing market, you know, it's, it's a no brainer. And really I was looking to develop a whole bunch of new skills and really have a sense of freedom, you know, living in a van, um, you have everything with you. Not only do you got to pare down and kind of be minimal to make van life work, but you know, I can go anywhere, say I end up working in another province or whatever, whatnot, you know, I can go, I don't need to now look for somewhere to rent, etc. cetera. Um, you know, no more sleeping on friends, couches. I can pull up anywhere and have everything I need, you know, picture music festivals, you know, no more hungover tent tear down, you know, I just hop in my van and drive away. I love to travel and to explore. And for me, it's not just about the destination or the thing that you're seeing, but also about, you know, like I find a lot of joy in meeting, you know, the people along the way and, you know, those little hole in the wall places and little small towns and just like the conversations that, you know, you have that way. And I find that just a much more fulfilling way of, uh, of travel as opposed to just hitting tourist spots and, and being in a van, you got a road trip uh, everywhere so you get to hit all those little small places along the way so the purpose of this video is to to tell my story um, my truth I guess you could say for a long time I, I've lived a life of, of dishonesty um, I was so insecure with myself that I would behave differently um, around others and only tell them the things that I wanted them to know about me which was the good things or that, you know, to make it seem like I had all my shit together. I was putting time and energy into people who really couldn't give a shit about me. Um, and so much of my self-worth was, you know, based extrinsically and on what I believed others to feel about me. That's how I felt about myself. After cutting these people out of my life, um, you know, and spending months working at developing a healthy self-esteem and self-image, I've learned that I have so much to be proud of. Um, I've learned that I can be completely truthful with myself and really be proud of who I am. Um, it's pretty cool to be able to just own who you are. And this video is an exercise for me to help understand that I, I'm really, I could never be anyone's or everyone's cup of tea rather. And that's okay. I've made so many mistakes building this van and I can't wait to tell you about all of them. In no way is my van perfect. I'm not an experienced builder by all, by any means. <clears throat> In fact, you know, prior to this summer of 2019, I didn't even know what a two by four was. Um, so I have nothing to sugarcoat. I'm going to tell you exactly how it is and hopefully in the process, maybe inspire a few others who, you know, who are thinking about or are currently in the process of their own conversion uh, to, you know, go out there and start their own journey. 
you know, maybe even take away some of the lessons and little tips and tricks that I learned, um, which is why if you have any questions, feel free to comment them down below and uh, I'll do my best to help you out. Other people are probably, you know, wondering the same thing. So, you know, let's do it. So after doing some uh, research, I, uh, I initially made a little pros and cons presentation for my parents and I FaceTimed them and, and told them my idea. So this was probably November of 2019. And keep in mind, I'm, I'm telling this idea, you know, hey, I want to spend 30 grand on a luxury pedophile van and turn it into an RV by myself with little or no building experience. You can imagine uh, telling, you know, a traditional Dutch man, you know, raised by wartime parents who were afraid to throw anything out, you know, the idea of spending money, let alone 30 grand, was uh, pretty out of the question. But to my surprise, you know, I, when I told them and I was like, hey, you know, I've done all the math and this is, you know, how much money I'd be saving and all this, you know, it was quite cool. Um, they started to really see the passion and the idea and they ended up being more excited about it than I was. And that excitement really carried through throughout the entire build process. So shout out to my mom and dad. Thank you for being so supportive. I love you. So over that next month, my dad and I, we really just emailed back and forth, uh, tons of links to Kijiji ads of used vans and really get an idea of what we wanted and you know what could work and what was within our budget and going oh hey you know this van has you know it comes with this already done to it or you know and just kind of weighing out the code pros and cons and as you know vans started to sell you know we kind of pared down our our list and so it was over Christmas break um, that year that planned to tour a few the kind of three major ones that I was looking at and. After touring, you know, two vans earlier in the day that, you know, they ended up to be total busts. And by bus, I mean like repairing just the mechanical and the body damage or rust, etc. cetera, um, ex would exceed the cost of the value of the van. And so that's just to get it to normal mechanical shape. Um, so at that point, it really made no sense to, to purchase those two. So I was feeling really doubtful. I was kind of upset. And, my dad and I are driving and so we just decided to stop at this last, you know, van and go check it out. And lo and behold, this thing is, mm, this thing is incredible. On the exterior, no, no rust. Mechanically, it runs pristine. It's, it's right in our price range. When you know, you know. It was a 2013 Mercedes Sprinter 2500, uh, the 144 inch wheelbase had a 356,000 kilometers on it when I bought it. It was gorgeous. Uh, filthy, <laughs> but gorgeous. So after negotiating a price, uh, we put a down payment on it and came back about a week later to pick it up. So it sat in the driveway for months until I graduated that following spring and was able to work on it. So uh, the van, it was originally used as a work van for a mobile service technician, you know, mobile mechanic for a heavy equipment rental company. A lot of people can attest to this when buying, you know, a used commercial cargo van, uh, a van. More times than not, you're buying a van that was, you know, used for heavy work. Um, so I didn't know, you know, what was going to be behind the panels and in what condition the interior body, you know, was going to be. But based on everything that I had saw on the the exterior, that was a, a risk that I was willing to take and a risk that I'm very glad that I took. The van came with a partition wall, fiberglass insulation, a work table and some aluminum, aluminum shelves. Yeah, it was filthy. Six years of dirt, grease and assorted muck just caked that thing. It was, it was gross. So over the remainder of that term, I was back in school, but I spent my you know, free time just researching hundreds of hours of videos. Uh, making little notes on each with you know links to like the timestamp at a certain point in a video going like oh hey I really like this fridge idea or hey I like this layout or to a certain product and so I just started like really building this kind of catalog of certain features that I really liked and what I wanted in my van um, or what I didn't want and after researching um, what I 
wanted to include in my van was, you know, the first and most important aspect of my build was to design with purpose. So to really examine all the products that would be in the, in the van and then building with intent, you know, having a designated space for everything. I'd seen some van build videos of people that kind of the placement of certain or the storing of certain products is more an afterthought. And so it was kind of this, always this awkward, you know, like, Oh yeah. And then we just stuff this in this corner and leave it. I didn't want that. I want everything to be functional. So that way, whatever state the van was in, whether I was, you know, preparing for, you know, to go to bed at night or when I was having people over, et cetera, there was a space for everything that was out of the way, a clean clutterless environment. Um, next, I really wanted it to feel homey. Um, that was really important to me. You see some van builds where they're just more like kind of industrial. I don't know. I'm a big fan of like industrial, you know, furniture and that whole like exposed brick aesthetic. But in terms of like just pure metal framing and then just like a mattress on it and just kind of everything is like so lightweight and just, I don't know, institutional almost. I really wanted my van uh, to feel like warm because um, I'm going to be living in it for the, the next while. Phase one of the build includes everything prior to insulation. So I began with stripping everything from the van. So removing the partition wall, all the trim, insulation, and all of the existing aftermarket electrical components. So that would be like the inverter, uh, this 120 volt outlet, and then uh, these two LED bar lights. So with every, everything removed, gave the van deep clean. Man oh man, was it ever greasy. Um, I want the van to last. So I made the proactive decision to rust proof the entire van. So this included grinding down surface rust everywhere, uh, sealing certain holes, deburring and, and rust treating everything. Sprinters are notorious for rusting um, behind the exterior trim. So I removed it, treated everything, then filled the, the little trim clips um, that secure the trim to the van with uh, Sikaflex and then reinstalled the trim. Um, it's not going anywhere, it's, it's weatherproof now. The first major project of the conversion was the installation of my vent fan. This made the whole thing seem real. You know, once I cut a hole in the ceiling, there's no going back. Um, you know what they say, measure 217 times, cut once, hopefully. After, uh, after I treated the, the exposed metal edges, you know, I used some construction adhesive and some clamps to attach. Uh, some wooden framing members around the perimeter of the hole that I just cut to give the, the fan flange some more material to grab into and really create a stronger connection when I installed it. So once the fan was secured into place, I applied a layer of Dicor uh, self-leveling lap sealant around the trim of the fan to, to really waterproof it. While on the roof, <laughs> it made sense to finish it. So the next part was installing uh, solar panels. So the van already had a fan in the ceiling, not like a RV fan, but one of those cylindrical stock Mercedes fans. Um, so the position of my van fan was fixed. It, it had to be in that spot. So my solar array had to be designed around that. So since solar is my main energy source, um, I included the maximum amount of panels that I physically could on the roof. And drilling solar panels directly to the van roof is possible and you do see a lot of people do it, but I really wanted to house them in something a lot more robust and secure, something that wouldn't rust, but also wouldn't cost me thousands to have someone else do it. Um, my van had come with, you know, the factory roof rails installed, so I really had to get creative. Um, I was seeing a lot of van conversions use 80-20 aluminum uh, for more of the interior work, but never for a roof rack. So I kind of jerry-rigged some stuff and just designed it from scratch. So pretty much um, I took 80-20 uh, T-Track to mount to the van and then used 80-20 to house the panels and then suspended them on the roof and then to attach them to the T-Track, which is attached to the van. I emailed Rocky Mountain Motion Control, company out in BC, um, great to work with. They custom cut all the 80-20 to the specified lengths, included all the necessary fasteners that I need, um, and then sent it to me so I could assemble it and, uh, and install it. So with no blueprints, uh, the spacing for the factory uh, mounting holes, I had to position the T-Track on the roof and then take a Sharpie and make dots 
uh, from underneath and then pilot drill or sorry drill pilot hole uh, from the underside and then use an auger bit attached to a drill press um, so that way I could feed the the head of the, the hex bolt through the track and then it would sit flush against the van. The final solar array consists of four 100 watt monocrystalline uh, Renogy solar panels. Uh, they're connected in parallel which you know was to help combat the effects of partial shading um, and yeah they're wired in parallel via a bunch of uh, extension cables which eventually all feed into two single MC4 uh, extension cables that run through this uh, solar cable entry gland that I mounted onto the roof and then they run down into my charge controller uh, which is in the van more on that later at this time I, I was initially skeptical of installing a sound deadening mat I'd never you know really uh, heard much about it before or like the effectiveness of it um, and because I was planning on spray foaming everything I was you know even more skeptical but I went ahead and purchased a few boxes and installed it and man oh man am I ever happy that I did so I purchased a couple of boxes of kill mat and installed it all throughout the van um, it kind of turned the van into a bit of a spaceship <laughs> The next step was to rough in all the electrical wires um, in the van that would be hidden after you know I'd spray foam, so things that didn't really need to be changed or, or altered after install. So this included uh, the wires for my LED ceiling lights, my vent fan, backup camera, the beacon light, my fridge, um, the heater, and my shore power mount. So after this, uh, my dad and I began installing flooring members on the upper grooves of the channels um, using construction adhesive and this layout you know is intended to be strategic and that I put more framing members where I would be spending most of my time um, and I knew the location of all of my cabinets and where they would be on our floor plan so I knew where I, they needed to be mounted to the floor and so I strategically put framing members in those locations to really give that more material to screw into instead of just a half inch plywood subfloor. So now with the van cleaned, um, rust proof, and all my electrical roughed in, I was ready to insulate. So I chose to go with closed cell spray foam uh, due to the fact that it has the highest R value uh, per square inch, um, as well as the fact that it also functions as an air and a vapor barrier. Now, to some this sounds almost too good to be true, um, but spray foam doesn't come without its risks. So firstly, it's, it's definitely more expensive than other options. Um, and there's not much price difference between a DIY kit and having a professional install it for you. Um, luckily, I was able to, to, to time it perfectly. Like I'd known that I'd wanted to do it myself. Um, and luckily I was able to time it perfectly and finesse a normally $825 kit from Lowe's uh, for around 450 bucks by taking advantage of their uh, their Victoria Day online sale and then combining it with the online coupon code that I already had. Um, so it ended up being like a really very cost effective way and I'm super happy, it's super warm. Spray foam is, uh, is extremely temperature sensitive and after spending days researching its proper handling instructions and coordinating that with the weather forecast, I was able to sunbathe the tanks uh, to bring them up to the correct temperature and uh, bring the interior of the van as well as the air temperature in the van um, up to the correct temperature to really optimize the install. Otherwise, it really turns soupy and uh, doesn't adhere properly. And well, you know, you're out 825 bucks and have a super sticky, soupy mess to clean up. This was right at the peak the first wave of, of uh, COVID. So ordering a special PPE or Tyvek suit was really out of the question. They were out of stock everywhere. It was 28 degrees outside. So here I am, my dad's hold uh, coveralls and a winter beanie. So I suited up, took a deep breath and just kind of went for it. Didn't really know what to expect, but the install went great. Um, it gets literally everywhere. So remember to tape off accordingly. Um, I thought I had covered everything that I didn't want sprayed, um, but yeah, 
yes, as you'll see in the fan, um, there are definitely some spots that I missed. So using the, the 600 board feet kit, I ended up getting the, the maximum amount of spray foam um, that I could possibly fit into the van. You know, in some spots there's well over, there's three plus inches. Um, just every cavity is, is filled to the absolute brim with spray foam. I chose fiberglass insulation for the lower panel in my sliding door, uh, as well as the lower panels in uh, the rear doors. That's just because of the locking mechanisms and stuff. I, if maintenance ever needs to get done to them. Making friends with mechanics 101. I let it cure for a day and then came back and shaved down all the excess foam uh, with an oscillating tool uh, and a knife. At this time, I removed the headliner and filled it with some remaining sound deadening mat and uh, some fiberglass insulation. So with the foam shaved, uh, I began phase two of the build. So making it feel like a home. So the first step was to clean the existing factory subfloor. It was super greasy, hadn't been touched in, in six years. Um, and then I traced out my flooring members on top of it so I knew where to screw into. And then with the factory floor, there are tons of holes um, that are originally used as tie down locations. But when you remove those, those clips, um, you're just left with a whole bunch of holes in your subfloor. So I needed to fill these holes and I've seen on eBay or something, there's some products that you can get. Some company does it for you, but it's, they're like 50 bucks to have them shipped to you and stuff. Don't. So I just cut, I uh, just, you know, did some measurements and, uh, kind of custom made some, some ones on my own. Turned out super nice, the floor sits super flush. Oi. So with everything flush, um, I put in a self-leveling concrete underlayment uh, to hide any imperfections um, in the floor so that the, when I installed my actual floor, uh, the finished product is super smooth and there's no like little bumps. Because uh, initially you won't see those, uh, those imperfections, but as the floor settles over time, those imperfections really start to show through and it's, it's kind of, you know, not super nice when it could easily be prevented. I couldn't find any uh, sheet vinyl that I like, so I ended up going with a really nice dark mahogany uh, luxury vinyl plank. Um, yeah, I love it. Uh, shout outs to the entire team at PDJ Flooring in Waterloo, Ontario. Super knowledgeable, super friendly staff. Before hopping right into the install, I, I really, I spent some time cutting all the unique pieces and doing a dry fit um, of how everything was, was going to be as I applied it. So that way, when I applied the glue, I wasn't scrambling if something didn't fit or if something you know needed to be changed. It was just everything was perfect, super easy install. So yeah, I used a trowel, applied the glue, um, waited for it to turn this kind of dingy yellow color, and then yeah, laid down the flooring and um, let it set. And then I channeled my inner skater and rode, a, rode over it a bunch of times and uh, yeah, sealed the deal. To finish off the flooring, I cut some angled aluminum uh, to secure the edges and, and painted it black to, to really make the floor pop. After the flooring was installed, it was time to start working on the ceiling. So using 5 16 um, thick tongue and groove pine from Rona, I conditioned the wood um, because pine's notorious for not absorbing stain evenly, and then applied numerous coats of a Minwax uh, dark walnut stain. When I was happy with the stain, I applied two coats of a water-based polyurethane. What I didn't realize <laughs> was that the plastic tarp I was using um, to work outside and have the, the plank sit on um, actually melted to the, the wood as it was drying. And so yeah, it was impossible to come off. So I had to start from scratch, sand everything um, and start, start again. It was sad, it was frustrating, but the final product when I did it the second time was much better than when I did it the first. So I'm super happy with uh, how it turned out and I'm super glad that mistake came up. Next, it was about cutting boards uh, to length and then staggering the joints, marking them accordingly. Um, and then at the same time, drilling out holes for uh, my recessed LED ceiling lights. 
And then after pushing the boards in one by one, uh, kind of working my way across um, and drilling pilot holes, I then removed everything, treated the, the holes that I just drilled in the ceiling, and then reinstalled everything. At this point, I installed the flange for my max air fan, which really brought the whole ceiling together. So if you're in the, if you're thinking about doing a van build, um, a big feature that often gets neglected is uh, deciding or choosing a van based on the interior standing height. And people often think, oh, I don't need to, uh, I'm fine with, you know, leaning down. But the truth is that living in here a lot, you, uh, you really want to be able to stand up. So I'm 6'2". And this is the high roof model. So fortunately, um, just for reference, so I'm standing up fully straight with shoes on. This is when the van's completely done. So flooring, insulation, and the ceiling. And I have about one index finger um, in between the top of my head and the ceiling. Before installing the cross members for my bed frame, I really wanted to finish everything underneath the bed first. So that way I wasn't hunched over and working. Um, so I cut in a 30 amp shore power mount. Um, although I will most likely normally only ever be plugging into a normal 15 amp outlet, um, you know, if I ever park in a friend's driveway or something like that. But the, the reason I went with a 30 amp is just if I'm ever in a, a campground or something and I like really need to charge my batteries, I can do that. And then to offset that, I just have a 15 amp adapter um, that I plug into the 30 amp short power mount and then just run a normal extension cord into a 15 amp household outlet to charge my batteries. So next, scribed, cut, paint, painted and sealed all of the paneling for under my bed. The van originally came uh, with this weird hole in the side of the van that was used as a vent for their compressor. So I figured I'd repurpose the space uh, by cleaning it up and fitting in uh, these ducts to provide ventilation for my fridge and my electrical components during the summer months. And then during the winter, I, I've taped it off um, with a plastic sheet and then just filled it with insulation. And so with the vent as well, um, I just to prevent any sort of critters or um, little bugs uh, from getting into the van, I installed um, a couple of layers of like a uh, screen door material and so I just took the material and laid it on itself in like a cross hatching pattern and when I riveted uh, this vent to the van I riveted through the screen door material so it just held in there super nice and it's not going anywhere. I installed the joist hangers and cross members for my bed which was relatively easy after having built a few decks previously. So with the bed frame installed, it was now time to do most of the electrical. So after hundreds of measurements, calculations, figuring out wire gauge requirements based on loads and usages of that wire gauge requirement changed depending on where it was located in the van, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, calculating correct fuse sizes, exactly what components I need, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I got to work on electrical. So I plan on making a, a very detailed electrical video where I break down everything in my van, including detailed explanations of each component, the science behind everything, how to size fuses and wire gauges correctly, the proper order to connect each system, the science behind different battery types, how to calculate how much solar or battery capacity you'll need and so on. But for time's sake, in this video, I'm just going to be covering which products I used in my build. So as mentioned before, I have 400 watts of solar on the roof. That runs down to my Victron 130 MPPT charge controller, which converts the higher output DC voltages into a lower, more usable voltage needed to charge my batteries. I have the van wired to be able to charge my batteries from the unused power of my vehicle's alternator as I'm driving. To do this, I have a Sterling ProBat Ultra battery-to-battery -battery charger. Finally, I'm able to charge my batteries via shore power via Sterling Power 1230. These provide energy for my 500 amp hours of lithium ion batteries. The batteries I went with are Kepworth. Um, they had no Amazon reviews when I bought them, which was kind of scary. However, to my surprise, they work perfectly and I would highly recommend them. To monitor the life of my batteries and what percentage of battery I have remaining, I have a Victron BMB712 battery monitor which I control from my kitchen galley. 
Finally, to convert the 12 volt DC power into 120 volt AC, I have a Giondel 3000 watt pure sine wave inverter. When doing your electrical, you want to have someone sign off on it. It's a really good idea to go to an electrician and, and just make sure everything's in order. It's one thing when you're building cabinets, you can kind of anticipate if something's going to go wrong. So for example, you know, you have a guard on your table saw so you don't cut your finger off, etc. But with electrical, the problems and the, the dangers are often kind of hidden and they don't, you don't really know that there is a danger in, until it happens. So say you, you know, just accidentally touch two wires together, you could short out your entire system and, and ruin thousands of dollars worth of products. So with the electrical uh, box, pretty well finished. My dad took a week off from work to help build the cabinets. Again, YouTube became my best friend, watching hours and hours of cabinet science videos, you know, learning how cabinets are built and the science behind them. So much time was spent planning everything from hardware measurements, assessing all the items that would go into these cabinets, then taking you know, product measurements and then designing functional spaces around that. So from there, figuring out the minimum drawer size requirements, I would need to fit each product, then subtracting the face fan measurements and spaces for drawer slides and tolerances, etc. It's giving me the maximum dimensions that I could make each drawer. So essentially designing from the outside in and then figuring out appliances and stuff and designing from the inside out. Uh, so it's a multi-stage process, super detailed, and I, this is really a, a part in your build that's just super important. So that way, when it's time to move in all your stuff, you're not struggling to find places. Everything has a place um, and you know where everything is. With all these designs and features in mind, I calculated the amount of wood we would need and, and quoted it out. Uh, the plan was to build everything out of clear pine and Baltic birch plywood. I'm super happy with this choice. It's important to note that no edge of the van is straight or square. So everything has to be made custom you'll get extremely, extremely good at scribing. So using a piece of cardboard and a pencil to trace out the curve of the van and then tailoring your design around it. It takes a long time and it's super frustrating, but it's, it's super worth it. You know, this is where patience is key because there's no better feeling when you set in the cabinets and they fit absolutely perfectly. The plan was to have two bedside cabinets, an underbed storage cabinet, a bench seat that would contain my fridge, and a kitchen unit containing storage overhead and an underneath. For the bedside cabinets, the one on the left contains all my clothes as well as my electrical outlets, and the one on the right stores all of my assorted charging cables, and finally, an empty cabinet functioning as a laundry chute uh, to go to my laundry hamper underneath. I constructed the two bedside cabinets entirely out of Baltic birch plywood, except for the three framing members of the clothing cabinet, uh, which I used clear pine. Half inch plywood works great for everything, um, except for the backing, which I used eighth inch Baltic birch to be able to bend and uh, really follow the natural curve of the van. For the shelving, I dadoed half inch grooves in the framing and then cut shelving to the correct length, then just wood glued them and pressure fit them into place. If I were storing you know, much heavier objects, I'd obviously put some, some embracing underneath, but since it's just clothes, um, you know, these are dummy strong for the, for their purpose. I constructed an underbed cabinet that's accessible from the inside of the living space and was designed to store my supplements, my instant pot, my induction cookware, and have a functional fold out table that was used as both a prep space for my kitchen and uh, a desk for my bench seat. Um, it's all soft closed, so it just will slide right back into place on its own. The bench seat was designed with the intent to maximize space by providing storage for my fridge as well as a functional seat. It was a bit of research to figure out optimal dimensions for ergonomic bench seats and then integrate that into something that works with the dimensions that I could or that I had uh, to build. The overhead cabinet was designed uh, with my large forehead in mind um, so that it wouldn't hit. <laughs> wouldn't crash into the cabinet when I'm cooking, yet it still manages to hold all of my dry food. It, uh, it locks via this like uh, hidden overhead lock, so I just clip on it. Just locks in place, it's not going anywhere. So using gas straps for custom cabinets is a lot of meticulous measurements, but thankfully my dad is super patient, so he spe spearheaded that one uh, while I worked on the kitchen. 
I repurposed the work table the previous owners had and turned it into a butcher block countertop. My neighbor Doug routed the underside of it to shed some weight and we sanded it and stained it with a dark walnut stain that we used on the ceiling. I love the hundreds of scratches and dings and that this table has. I think it gives it a lot of character. I'm really happy that I was able to, to repurpose it. It's an ode to the humble beginnings of the van and, and its past. I kept it out of the van while I waited for my sink to arrive. And once the cabinets were complete, we dry fit everything, then measured and cut the remaining plywood for wall paneling, as well as built all of the drawer boxes and drawer faces. With everything sanded, I called up my buddy Wes to come help paint. After numerous coats of a nice pearl white paint, we let everything dry and then applied some oil-based polyurethane. To much surprise, I came out the following morning to see it had turned everything into the dingy smoker's home dehydrated urine looking yellow. It was hideous. So it was back to square one, sanding and repainting everything again. Moral of the story, use a clear water-based polyurethane on water-based paints. Once everything dried and we had sealed everything for the second time, we mounted them in the van using cross nuts in the ceiling and along the, the side panel of the van. I scribed out this little wall to section off the, the kitchen from the cab and protect the back of my head against any kitchen knives that decide to go AWOL as I'm driving. I then installed hardware and the magnetic catches to keep the cabinet secure and closed um, as I was driving. Next up was tackling the headliner shelf. Using a Vancelary headliner shelf template specific for the Sprinter, I traced it out on a three quarter inch Baltic birch plywood, sanded and stained with the dark walnut stain that I used on the ceiling and the, the kitchen counter, then mounted it in the van. This thing is dummy strong, it's not going anywhere now. My sink had arrived, so we began tackling the plumbing. The plumbing setup is intentionally made to be super simple. I wanted to use a manual foot pump so I could control the water pressure as well as get a nice calf workout every time I use it. Fresh water is in this jug here. Um, it gets pumped to this foot pump and then up from the foot pump um, to the faucet. And then from the faucet it goes into the sink and then into my gray water jug here. Then when it's uh, when they're full, I just take this one, just dump it, and then yeah, just fill this one back up and then just reinstall everything. So the sink, it's just, it's actually a undermount sink um, that I used as a, as a drop-in. Um, I did this just because I couldn't find a drop-in sink that was within my budget for the dimensions that I was hoping for. Um, so I really wanted a 14 by 14 sink and then as deep as I could go. And so this is 10 inches and you never, you never really notice how shallow a sink is until you start to wash dishes in it. Um, so I'm really happy that I went with the deeper sink. I installed a peel and stick backsplash, magnetic knife block, and a magnetic spice rack to finish off the kitchen area. Um, so they just stick on the wall like that. Uh, these things are a pain to kind of like twist off. So I just keep them all in the on position and then just magnet them up like that. And then just when I need to. The bulk of the van done, it was time to mount the electrical box into the van. And with that in place, we connected all of our various systems. Luckily, nothing went kaboom. Working in electrical for his entire life, my dad carried this process. Next, I cut in all of the outlets and controls for the electrical in my kitchen galley, including my 120 volt AC outlet, my 12 volt USB outlets, uh, the smart temp control for my Obasto heater, the switch for my inverter so I can turn it off when not in use, uh, dimmer switches for my lights, and my battery monitor to monitor the life of my batteries. Uh, so the back three are on a dimmer and then the front five. At this point, it's early September and winter's approaching, so it was time to install a heater. I hesitated buying a cheap uh, Chinese heater, so I started looking for a well-known Abasto Airtop 2000 SD heater. I bought it on Kijiji from some guy named Jim. My cool guy. Nice, Jim. The install process was lengthy and my dad spent hours running and mounting lines under the van while I finished off the kitchen and other stuff. So he really carried this part in the build. Thanks, dad. We then replaced uh, transmission lines and cleaned the brakes. Finally, winter proofing and stealth proofing the van. So for stealth proofing, this involved putting uh, my hard hat as well as some high-vis uh, vests on each of the, the seats, um, as well as this little uh, contractor's log workbook. Um, in the front dash that came with the van. 
installed some custom uh, aftermarket German locks specific for the Sprinter. So Sprinters are notorious um, for being easy to break into. And when you're building a van, you kind of want to protect your investment. Um, so I invested in these aftermarket uh, locks. They're super sick, super easy. Uh, boom, nothing's uh, getting in there. Um, so I have one in the back here, one on the sliding door, and then two on the driver and passenger's doors. Those are on the interior of the van. For weatherproofing on top of insulation, um, it really involved creating a blackout curtain um, and insulated window coverings. So I had no experience with sewing, but I knew that it would be much cheaper for me to really learn on my own as opposed to buying this stuff pre-made. Um, you can buy pre-made insulated window coverings, just expect to pay upwards of, you know, 12, 1400 bucks, depending on where you get them. Um, but really, if you do it yourself, you can include as much insulation as you want, depending on where you live. I live in Southwestern Ontario, Canada, so the winters are decently cold. So to increase the, the functionality of uh, these insulated window coverings, one side uses Reflectix, or in my case, just use cheap water heater insulation. It's the exact same thing, just without a brand name. You pay one-tenth the price. You can get it from any hardware store. Boom. And then quilt batting in the middle and blackout material on the exterior on the other side. And then cut to the exact shape of the window cavities. It made it so I could reverse them depending on the season. So in the summertime when it's hot out and I want to keep the hot air out, I put the reflective side against the window and whether in the winter or at night, I just put the blackout uh, fabric against the window. I then calculated out based on that how many yards of fabric I would need um, and then pretty much started. So I bought the fabric from Lens Mill Store in Port Dover, Ontario, which is where I'm from. Uh, shout outs to Jenna. You were very, very helpful. I uh, couldn't have done it without you. So with no sewing experience, I uh, set out on my hand sewing journey and boy oh boy was I ever humbled very, very quickly. Uh, sewing is an art and I'm super glad that I, I learned how to do it. But so I, I started with uh, where my vent fan is. There's a but pretty much it's, it's a plastic barrier and it lets in a lot of, of cold air uh, during the winter. So I wanted to create like a magnetic, uh, almost like insulated pillow that I can just magnet in there and it just keeps the, the warm air in, the cold air out. Just magnets up. Installed some magnets underneath the fan. Um, yeah, so just magnets into place. It's not going anywhere. And yeah, so it just sits up like that. See, no more light gets in. And I thought, what better way than to start hand sewing with this project? It didn't use a lot of fabric. It was just made out of scraps, technically. Um, and yeah, so I started and yeah, yeah. Knowing that I'd be around till 2026 trying to finish the all of the curtains, uh, my brother's girlfriend, hopefully my future sister-in-law someday, uh, brought over her sewing machine and was so kind to help me complete the rest um, of the project. So thank you, Lauren. The final thing to do was to install hooks on my headliner shelf so that I could mount uh, the grommets for my curtain so it would hang there properly. So I took some measurements and just strategically laid it out so that I could fold the cabinet on itself and then all the grommets would line up in the middle so I could hang from one hook out of sight um, just to keep everything neat and organized and out of the way when not in use. The final step was to mount uh, neodymium magnets um, in these little pouches to each of the, the window coverings. So you can see the, the magnets. I sewed them into these little pouches and then just put them at strategic points where there was a lot of metal uh, or exposed metal uh, to be able to just magnet properly to the window cavity and then it just keeps the covering in there really nice. Yeah, can't even tell there's a blackout curtain there. So that way it could adhere to the van wall and just really trap out all that light. This is what it looks like at night. Yeah, there's zero light in here, which is great. So having never sewed before, uh, this was extremely cool. I can see why people like it. 
I was super happy that I learned it on my own and I definitely feel confident now if I ever need to alter a you know, piece of clothing or sew something, I could definitely, definitely do it. Um, it's a pretty handy skill and I hope to kind of continue that in the future. Finally, I installed the dash cam and, and moved in. It was around this time uh, that the van got safety and after a bunch of insurance work getting it registered in his RV, uh, the van's now road ready. So I get asked this a lot. Um, Yo, Cam, you know, where do you go to the bathroom or take a shower? And the truth is that there's no toilet and there's no shower in here. So when I was designing the build, I had planned for my postgrad. I was uh, going to be in school in Hamilton. And I my plan was to just get a um, like a good life fitness membership. And then that way I could work out. I could go to the washroom. I could... Um, shower etc use Wi-Fi and then just r sleep in their parking lot and just alternate parking lots because I think there's like four or five locations but obviously for those emergency situations perks of being a guy you can just pee outside or worse comes to worse if I'm like in a super populated area and can't do that and can't find a washroom worse comes to worse just like peeing a Tropicana jug or something and then for a shower um, I designed, when I designed my roof rack, I designed it in such a way that with uh, the 80-20, I designed a solar shower that I just need to build out of a PVC pipe. But I have the designs and everything. It just, uh, I, I designed it and built the system around that just down the road if I take a road trip like across the states or from Alaska to Chile or something. Um, it'd be nice having a solar shower but for right now, I have no need for one. So the goal right now is just to remain stealthy. So at this point in the video, um, I gotta give some, some thanks uh, to some very important people. Uh, this van conversion project could not have been possible without the help of a few people. So firstly, my parents, uh, mom and dad, thank you so much for putting up with all of my frustrations. Um, as I navigated this build project and being so willing to help in any way that you can. Um, Dad, thank you for all of your help from electrical to cabinets to the heater. I couldn't have done it without you. All the time you spent outside um, helping me research projects and watching installation videos, etc. All that time that I'm sure you way would have rather spent uh, with your wife, you know, actually enjoying your time together. Um, but you chose to, to spend out with me and really help me uh, chase whatever it was that I was pursuing. So thank you, Dad. And thank you to my neighbors, uh, Doug and Margaret, the world's cutest little Scottish couple, uh, for all their you know all your consistent motivation and lending me you know your table saw among other tools as well as some sewing supplies and and really just constantly checking in and making sure I was okay and how I was doing and how things were coming along with the build. Uh, special shout outs to you, Doug. Uh, you came up with the name for the van, Moby, and uh, it's stuck ever since. So, yeah, thank you for Moby Van. Thank you to my sister, Sid, uh, and my brother, Garrett, for definitely putting up with a lot of my moods that came from the frustrations of the hurdles uh, when building, and really constantly checking in with me and asking, you know, how the conversion's going and just being super excited and really helping uh, me stay motivated. Thank you to Lauren, uh, my brother's my brother's girlfriend, uh, for volunteering. Yeah, to give up your days as, as I learned to sew and really teaching me how a sewing machine works and stuff. Um, super useful, super great. I was really fortunate that you you were able to help. Um, yeah, and I can now enjoy my free time instead of spend hand sewing. So thank you. Uh, special shout out to my favorite aunt and uncle who aren't really my aunt and uncle, Marky and Tom. Thank you so much uh, for the induction cooktop, um, or the cookware, sorry. Um, I cannot wait to cook for you guys once this pandemic dies down a little bit and we're able to see each other again. But uh, mark your calendars, I'll definitely uh, definitely come up and cook you something nice. And finally, uh, thank you to my neighbor, Scott, um, who lives across the street. I'm sure you'll stumble upon this video as you browse random van build videos um, in your free time, which you normally do. Thank you um, for randomly popping over quite often and just really checking in and, and being super excited and asking me tons of questions about how the build's coming along. 
you know, seeing how pumped you were for me really made me feel really good about what I was doing and, and really motivated me, um, especially at certain times, you know, you just kind of knew when to pop over. It was kind of nice. Some of the, like the worst days I was having out on the build, or the, you know, and then you would come along and just kind of pump me back up, not even knowing that you were doing it and just, you know, really kept me motivated to keep building. And uh, your dog's also pretty cute too. So that was, that was nice. And hopefully, you know, hopefully this inspires you to, to build your own van build one day or pay me to do it for you. That'd be nice. So things I learned this, the van build was, was very humbling to say the least. Um, originally before the, the pandemic and before coronavirus even happened, I had this lofty goal of completing the van by August 1st so I could road trip to California while working a part-time job as I would be building. So starting May 1st, as a first time van builder, to have it done in three months. Man, was the header a lofty goal. I definitely underestimated uh, the amount of time it would take and overestimated both the smoothness of the van build process as well as my ability to breeze through um, these challenges as these hiccups and roadblocks presented themselves. With all the help from my dad, uh, we had the majority of the build done by September and resorted to finishing you know, the remaining few projects on weekends as he was home from work and I was off of school. Um, with, cho with choosing to do everything myself, I learned so many new skills in the process, being involved in every single step of the way from design to build. Um, yeah, having very little experience doing any of this beforehand, I now have a plethora of skills um, that are very marketable. Um, the rewards definitely exceed the risks and for anyone thinking about converting a van, I definitely recommend doing it all of yourself. It was also very humbling in how much more costly and it turned out to be you don't really realize it but those little trips to the hardware store definitely you know add up after a while you know whether it be you know picking up seventy dollars worth of paint and brushes and then all of a sudden oh i need this many lag screws or cross nuts or whatever it may be all of a sudden you know you're walking out of the hardware store with like spending having spent you know 110 150 bucks sometimes and doing that you know a couple times a month you know maybe a couple times a week sometimes you know you're making four trips in one day depending on what you're doing and originally when i had estimated all the costs and did all this this planning i had planned out all of like you know the major things all of my electrical components and and the cost of wood and and really what, what it's going to take to build, but I really neglected all of the, the kind of stuff that came with that, all of the, the little costs and those little costs really add up. Yeah. And then collectively they all added up to be a few grand more than I anticipated. So here's a spreadsheet of all of the purchases, um, that I made. This is excluding around a couple hundred dollars worth of hardware and around an extra two grand to have the van safetyed, um, brake lines replaced, the parts to replace uh, the sliding door trim and the new lines for the transmission. So no matter how much research you do, there will always be unexpected things that come up. That's not an excuse to do a super lackluster planning job. It's just food for thought and really shows the importance of really planning and put investing your time in planning to give you a, a lot more accurate and detailed picture of your, of your costs so that you're better equipped to deal with hurdles and, and stuff as they arise. In short, I bought the van for, with taxes included around 14 K and put around 20 K into it. I had originally planned on only putting between, you know, just over 15 K into the van, but with everything, um, that I mentioned, um, as well as just some other hiccups and products that came, along the way uh, and I spent over 20 into it. So all in all around 34,000 for the van. I've learned to always now plan for hiccups and to save money for these unforeseen circumstances. Um, 
if I was to, to build another van in the future, I'd probably allocate 10% of the total projected van costs. I'd add an extra 10% onto that for any sort of unforeseen costs. I loved this project. Um, and I definitely have a new passion for van life, uh, for building and just working with my hands and creating things. Having all of these skills now, I feel so much more confident and comfortable um, and just being handy, you know, like if friends are like, oh bro, I'm thinking about doing this, you know, helping them out do that or, or just like being handy, especially like hopefully as a husband, you know, down the road, being able to like just confidently fix things in the house or like, and not have to call someone else to do it. It's just very, it's very empowering. It's very nice. So for those people out there who were like me and didn't know the difference between a jigsaw and a table saw, didn't know, you know, the purpose of positive and negative bus bars, didn't know what datoing meant, you know, like it's doable. Like I didn't know any of this before starting and spent hundreds of hours researching and learning and you learn as you go. And as long as you, you're dedicated to it, like you can easily build a van. It's, it's gonna take a lot of research and the willingness to just absorb everything like a sponge, but it is doable. There are definitely hurdles that arise in any conversion, but much of these, both financially and time-wise, were reduced by how much detail I put into the planning phase. You know what they say, measure 217 times and hopefully you know cut once. My favorite high school teacher, Paul McCormick, uh, once famously said, you know, fail to plan, plan to fail. And it could not be more true. So thank you, Paul, for ingraining that in my brain. Uh, so thinking about everything, you know, taking hundreds of measurements and really taking a step back to assess who you are, what direction you want um, to take your van, will really help you design a functional um, van in an efficient manner. Sounds pretty cringy. I'm probably gonna end the video here, but yeah, with all the, the with all this in mind, here's the here's the final product. All right, so for kitchen storage, um, just have three uh, drawers here. So the first one, I just keep all of my uh, cooking utensils, cutlery, um, dishcloths, and then my fire extinguisher. Um, second one, I just keep all of my like plates, bowls, stuff for meal prepping, and then just dry food storage in these. Um, and then the bottom, this one, this is my garbage can. Currently don't have a bag in it. And then just, I keep my induction pot here. Table, um, so it can be used as a workspace for the bench seat or as an extra prep table um, for the kitchen when I'm cooking. Underneath, this is where I keep my induction cooktop and my induction uh, cook pans. And in the bottom here, I keep my Instant Pot and my, uh, most of my supplements. Yeah, so with the bench seat, uh, storage is pretty limited in a van, so uh, I had to combine it in the two. Uh, so this is where I keep my fridge. Um, so it's a Dometic CFX 65. And yeah, it's just a typical uh, chest fridge, very energy efficient. Um, but yeah, keep everything in there and then just slide it back into place. All right, so moving uh, on to the bedside storage um, and here, yeah, that, this is just where I ran all my electrical wires. Um, not much to see in there. This is where I keep uh, my shower caddy, um, my workout stuff, and then sweaters. And then underneath here, um, this folds up and I just put seasonal storage stuff in there. Currently nothing's in there, but I'll probably put sweatpants or just stuff I don't really wear too often in there. Um, yeah, so this is where I keep all my boxes and shorts, t-shirts, pants, and then summer shorts and some shoes are in there in the bottom. And moving along here, so this one, um, just uh, for all my stuff that needs to be hung up, and then in the bottom here, uh, it's just a couple of totes where I keep all my toiletries um, and stuff like that. 
uh, up here I just keep a lot of my supplements, my speaker, and then just my shaker cups. And I wired it this way so that way, um, say it's super late at night and I hear someone snooping around my van and I just want to check it out, I can just come over here and just turn it on.